Okay, so I want to welcome everybody who's on our webinar, uh, Can You See Me Now? Authentic Representation of People with Disabilities on Television. I'm Mariette Bates, the Academic Director of the Disability Studies Program here at the CUNY School of Professional Studies. In case you don't know about our program, we offer a bachelor's degree, a graduate certificate, and a master's degree in disability studies, as well as a master's of science in disability services in higher education. If you want to know more about our programs, I hope you'll visit our website. I want to thank my colleagues Heather Zeman and Darian Robinson for their help in organizing this event today. They just make everything easy, so thank you. I first met Dr. Beth Haller about a decade ago when she was visiting New York with a group of Russian journalists and needed some help with translation and visits to media outlets. I was struck at the time by her dedication to exploring the representation of people with disabilities in mass media, her energy and creativity, and her genuine interest in helping journalists from other countries write about disabled people. I immediately lured her into teaching for us in the master's program, as well as giving a disability studies lecture when her collection of essays, Representing Disability in an Ableist World, was published in 2010. And it quickly became the go-to text about media and disability in the disability studies field. Her subsequent look book about Helen Keller's journalism, Byline of Hope, was published in 2015, and it's been praised nationwide. We are so fortunate to have her with, her today, with us today to talk about more accurate and authentic representations of disabled people on television. Dr. Haller is professor of journalism, new media, at, and the graduate director of the communication management program at Towson University in Maryland. She's a former co-editor of the Disability Studies Quarterly, and in addition to her work at Towson, she's adjunct faculty in our program at the School of Professional Studies and at York University at Can in Canada. So Beth, I'm so happy that you're with us and look forward so much to hearing your presentation today. Thank you, Mariette. Um, very glad to do this webinar and thank you for everybody who's out there in attendance. Um, so I thought I'd just dive right in and the reason I want to do something about people with disabilities on television because I think we're headed into kind of another golden age. I don't know that we've had one before but we're going to look at a little history to see um, what we've had in the past. Okay, so the first slide is I'm just going to do a few slides that are kind of a history lesson about some people with disabilities, actors and performers who have been on television in the past and kind of broke some of the barriers. So the first slide, I'm going to just try to describe as much as I can. Um, pictures Jerry Jewell when she was on the show Facts of Life back in the early 80s. And she broke the small screen barrier by being the first person with a disability to be featured regularly on primetime TV. And, you know, she was more recently on television in the series Deadwood. So, you know, she's gone back and forth from being on different TV shows in different decades, um, but she's definitely a groundbreaker. Next is Linda Bove, who has a distinction of being a deaf person or disabled person with the longest recurring role on television history. She was on Sesame Street from 1972 to 2002. And I think shows like Sesame Street are really, really important. We just now have a autistic Muppet on Sesame Street. So, you know, it's always given a lot of good information, I think, about disability or deafness and been inclusive throughout the years. And that's great because it teaches a whole younger generation about the importance of inclusiveness. The next one is um, Ellen Corby, who remembers the Waltons, all of us oldsters do. <laughs> um, so back in the 70s when she was on the Waltons as Grandma Walton, um, in 1976 she had a stroke and um, you know, people thought, oh, her acting career is over, but she loved acting and decided that it was actually helpful for her recovery from the stroke and to move forward to go back to acting. So I don't know that there were other people who had um, had a stroke that had been an actor on television, but I think she's probably one of the first. And in my prep, 
um, I was digging around and I didn't even realize that Ray Charles had also been on television back in 1987 on the medical drama um, St. Elsewhere. And this is a blind actor, Tom Sullivan, that a lot of you probably haven't heard of because he was working much more in the 70s and 80s. So the reason I'm about to talk about him a little bit more is because they did research about his um, appearance on the 1980 episode of Mork and Mindy. And the reason I'm doing a few of these older shows is because there's actually been some research about kind of how they have um, taught the television audiences about disability and kind of knocked away some of their preconceptions. So the research about um, Sullivan's guest role on Mork and Mindy was an experiment that was done in 1984 looking at his, um, I actually haven't seen the episode because I can't find it on YouTube. So if anybody can find it on YouTube, please email me with the link. So he um, is a blind actor and what they said in this experiment was that this particular episode featured a non-stereotypical presentation of blindness. And um, so they decided to use that with um, the participants and have them watch the um, episode and see what their findings were. So they also discussed, after they showed the episode, discussed misconceptions and stereotypes about blindness. And their findings were that the viewing and the discussion of stereotypes created an unthreatening environment in which participants could shift their misconceptions and allow them to accept accurate information about disability. And I kind of think this is really important in the 80s when they were doing these kinds of experiments to see that the impact that um, having actors with disabilities on television had and the kind of education. People think of TV sometimes as this vast wasteland and it's not important. I'm here to tell you it's very important and these images, you know, are doing a lot of um, good in talking about disability issues, um, presenting people, you know, in their everyday life with different disabilities. So I'm a big pop culture um, enthusiast and think they have a really important place in our society. And then probably some of you know about Life Goes On, even if you don't remember it. So it was a family drama. Um, this is a picture of the family. It's a Caucasian family with three kids and a dog. And the, the son in the family had Down syndrome or has Down syndrome. So here are some facts about the um, Life Goes On and how it kind of broke new ground by hiring an actor with Down syndrome. So Chris Burke, who played um, the quirky character with Down syndrome had worked as an elevator operator before getting into acting, but he'd seen his older siblings go out on auditions and that's what he wanted to do. So he, um, you know, moved forward with his idea of becoming an actor and was very successful by being the star of the show. Um, the show was embraced by the National Down Syndrome Society. The pilot was screened for high school students with Down syndrome who are being mainstreamed to get their feedback. Um, there's technical assistance provided by the Los Angeles Down Syndrome Parents Group. The show's music composer actually lobbied to be the composer of the music, and he was not just looking for a job. He'd actually created the music for Cheers, but he wanted, he was so excited that the show was happening because he has a son with Down Syndrome that he wanted to be part of it, so he got the composer job. And then the last point, I think, is the most important. There was a report from one of the writers of the show who had a friend who was pregnant and got a um, diagnosis that she was going to have a child with Down syndrome. And she decided to keep the child because she said that after watching some episodes of the show, she saw that there was possibilities for her child. So I think, you know, we don't know of other women who might have made that same decision, but, you know, just the fact that people are getting an empowering view of somebody living their life with a different disability um, that I think is really important for audience members. And they also did an experiment about Life Goes On in 1999. I believe this was a Canadian study. Um, so they looked at both the quirky character and a documentary with an independent person with um, Down syndrome. And they found that um, the documentary did a little bit more of influencing the participants, but both of the um, media content really showed the participants 
that people with Down syndrome are active, socially engaged, and kind of disproved any negative stereotypes they had about people with disabilities for the participants. And I think most importantly, it led the participants to seeing people with Down syndrome as having an equal status in society. So I think that's really um, important to see that this television character is actually influencing American culture and other places that get our television. Um, so that's why, again, I think television is very important to um, kind of representation issues. So now we're going to fast forward to kind of more modern times in the last, say, five, six years. So this is a um, Entertainment Weekly story about actors with Down syndrome. So at that time in 2011, there were three primetime series that featured actors with Down syndrome and prominent roles. And so the picture is of Jamie Brewer, who was in American Horror Story, Lauren Potter, who was in Glee, and Luke Zimmerman, who was on, uh, let me remember which, um, Oh, Secret Life of the American Teenager. Um, it's no longer on the air. Anyway, so, you know, the fact that a major entertainment magazine is also noticing the kind of full placement of people with disabilities into acting roles, I think is fantastic because, again, even if you didn't watch the shows, you might be flipping through a magazine at the doctor's office and see, oh, wait, I want to see that. I might have a nephew with Down syndrome or whatever the reason. I think it draws more people to the content of the media when there's, or the TV when there's media coverage as well. So here's going to be a list of examples of disabled actors with recurring roles on scripted TV, and this is not, there may be many others, but please tell me if there are many others. So I gave my email at the beginning, and so let me know if you know of others. So the list, which I'll talk more about, Micah Fowler on Speechless from, he's been on there since last fall. Daryl Mitchell, who's a wheelchair user, is on NCIS New Orleans. Kurt Yeager, who's an amputee, was on Sons of Ar Anarchy. I think he's on another show now, too. Sean Birdie, Ryan Lane, Marley Matlin, all deaf actors on Switched at Birth. Jamie Brewer, who I mentioned, has Down syndrome. She's on American Horror Story. Luke Zimmerman, who has Down syndrome on Secret Life of the American Teenager. Lauren Potter on Glee. RJ Mitty on um, Breaking Bad. He has cerebral palsy. And Jerry Jewell on Deadwood, who also has cerebral palsy. And I want to touch base a little bit on invisible disabilities, too, because we rarely talk about that, because they get the media coverage usually when it's somebody using a wheelchair or has a disability that you can see, like they're blind or have Down syndrome. But um, Rachel Bloom, who is the creator and star of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and that title, she says, over and over is meant to be ironic. Um, it's not about using a derogatory word. But anyway, the show, I particularly like the show, and she's come out from the beginning talking about her own um, issues with mental health challenges. And so she really is kind of depicting an invisible disability in the show. And she's also not that likable of a character, so it's not any kind of inspiring stories. Um, but she kind of hits this kind of level of being very unlikable and self-centered, but then she you kind of see behind what's going on with her. So it's a kind of more nuanced portrait of somebody grappling with some mental illness um, issues. So I wanted to give a shout out to something that is actually talking about invisible disabilities because there's quite a number of um, actors who actually identify as having different kinds of invisible disabilities, but most of them don't talk about portraying that disability in films and television, even if they're kind of out with their learning disability or mental health challenge. And then there's now, you know, a great group of um, reality shows featuring disabled people. So this is a list of what I could find recently. Um, so Amazing Race has been on a long time, and they, you know, Almost every season or every other season, they feature a person with a disability. Born This Way is about adults with Down syndrome, which I'll talk more about later. Um, Dancing with the Stars has had, you know, a deaf man. Um, now DeMarco won last year. Little Couple on TLC, Little People Big World on TLC, 
multiple little women shows in LA, New York, Atlanta, and Dallas, and the Push Girls, which is a Sundance Channel's um, reality show about four or five wheelchair using women and kind of following them in their life. And what I like about reality shows featuring disabled people is typically from the get-go or at least very early on in the reality show, because it's representing people with disabilities, they have a lot more input as opposed to scripted television where the writers have a lot more power. So um, you're getting some interesting representation. There was, a, I think, Dr. Jen Arnold, who's on The Little Couple, talked about how she was very hesitant to ever be on a reality show, but they did The Little Couple Wedding, which was what kicked off the reality show. And she said she was just in a store, and um, this child came up to her and just started talking to her about what she learned about little people from Little People Big World. And she was just very casual and not, like, gawking or staring or anything. And she just started talking to her, and uh, Dr. Arnold said that it was very accurate information, and it kind of a light bulb went off, and she said, well, okay, let's do the series because I think we can, you know, give people accurate information. And also she's a medical education person too, so I think she saw it as a way to educate people about, you know, people living with um, dwarfism. Okay, I have a little case study about some research I've done on the ABC Family Show Switched at Birth, which is running into its last few episodes right now. So my case study is about the all sign language episode that they did called Uprising back in March 2013, and it was purposefully trying to mirror what had gone on in the 1988 Deaf President Now movement at Gallaudet University where the students shut down the university for almost a week um, trying to get a decision to put a deaf person in as president when they were successful in doing that. And so it was a really kind of interesting episode. The kind of narrative was that there was a deaf school that was going to be closed and they'd already opened the deaf school up to um, hearing students who wanted to take classes in sign language. So they had this kind of ally group as well. And um, this is kind of what's going on. A lot of deaf schools are being closed. So they really wanted to highlight that issue and it was a kind of a great way to also mirror what had happened in at Gallaudet. So here are some of the kind of symbols and deaf history that were in the episode. So that their message was that deaf people should be fighting oppression from the larger hearing society, um, that deaf activism has a rich history back to 19th century France, that deaf youth should become empowered, you know, because they're the future, and that the all ASL uprising show itself became a moment of deaf history. So because one of the characters in Switched at Birth is an artist, they um, had this kind of way they used a lot of street art and, you know, more, instead of traditional fine arts, they were using a lot more kind of protest art. And so one of the characters who's an artist, a hearing artist, um, came up with the Take Back Carlton, which is a young woman with a beret that has her fist up. And then Sean Birdie character is also in that image. And he's has his arms raised in, like, you know, power for the deaf community. And then it's also with a picture from the Deaf President Now movement where they went to the Capitol and unfurled their banner that said Deaf President Now. So you can see the kind of like protest imagery that they were recreating a bit in the um, show. And then Marley Matlin plays both the mother of the Sean Birdie character and also the um, a teacher of deaf history deaf culture at the um, school they were trying to close. So the message in the episode was deaf youth need to be empowered to fight for their rights. And there's the image of her signing, this is your fight. So a big part of this that in the research I did, looking at the deaf community's response and bloggers, deaf bloggers talking about it, was this whole idea of the older deaf community who remembered, not really that old, but the older deaf community who remembered the um, Deaf President Mal Now movement in 1988, and then the younger deaf community who might not, you know, they might be mainstreamed into a school where they're not getting much deaf history, so they're not even understanding that the show is actually presenting deaf history to them. And so deaf adults really liked the show because 
they said it was, you know, teaching the younger generation about deaf rights and deaf history. So what the deaf community said about the episode, um, 25 years after the historic protest at Gallaudet University uprising helped the younger generation understand the Deaf President Now movement in a 21st century context. And what they mean by 21st century context is the protest, air quotes on the show, um, used Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and just all the social media that would be available to protesters now. So it, it was really transformed into a kind of a social media um, protest that um, the younger generation might um, be interested in and see as more relevant to their lives. And the other interesting kind of point, which before I get to these other um, deaf community, what they said is that the ratings for that episode were quite high considering that there was literally no sound. It was only captioning. Um, I think there was some music, but um, the, if you wanted to watch that show, you had to pay attention to the screen. And the showrunner and creator of the show you know, said it was it was a risky move because, you know, people are used to looking at their phones while they're looking at television these days. And so the fact that you had to look at the screen to know what was going on in that episode, so they didn't lose any um, viewers because they were all um, ASL episode. And so another point from the deaf community was that the show showed, the show in general shows that there's nothing wrong with deaf people or their capabilities quote, that's the message the show has been telling all along. Um, another comment, by producing an all ASL show, ABC Family shows a message that's just as clear as Bay's Angry Girl poster, the one that I showed a few minutes ago, um, that deaf culture is something to be proud of. It has a legacy and a future to defend. And the last one is the deaf community thanked ABC Family for um, doing this episode, they said, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this hour of power. I like that phrase, hour of power, because that's really what it was. But it's really unique that this is a Hollywood production, a television network. You know, the deaf community, except for being actors, don't have a lot of input. But the um, showrunner, Lizzie Weiss, decided that she was going to make sure that you know, they were an authentic television show. So there was an ASL master on set at all times. All the writers went to a deaf high school to talk to deaf students. They all watched documentaries about deaf history. Um, and it was a very collaborative. I happened to interview the um, some of the writers. And it looked like it was a very collaborative set um, because one of the writers told me when she proposed a scene that one of the deaf actors said is not something that would have been talked about in the deaf community she took his note and changed the scene. So, you know, even though the writers were hearing, they're very collaborative and working with the deaf actors to make sure that their scripts were authentic. So, I mean, to me, that is a really great example of moving television into more authentic space by having writers and actors working together and the production team all working together to make sure the program is as authentic as possible. So the next show I'm going to talk about is Born This Way, which I call kind of the most real of all the reality shows because, it, you know, every reality show has, like, set up scenes. Um, but this is an image from A&E Network, which is where Born This Way um, airs. So it's seven young adults with Down syndrome, um, one Asian, one African American, and five Caucasian, or I guess one is Hispanic. Um, so it's a really interesting show and in that I think early on people thought, oh, well, it's only going to be people that come from the community of and family members of people with Down syndrome. They'll be interested, but I don't think that's the case. I know lots of people who watch it because they think it's very honest. And one of my friends, um, she does have a sibling with a disability, but she um, doesn't watch it because of that. She watches it because she loves the honesty on the show. She just loves the way the characters talk about their lives in a very kind of forthright way. So the focus of the show, according to the creators, was to focus on what adults with Down syndrome can do, not what they can't do. And um, they did talk to different people with Down syndrome who watched the show to see 
their reaction and a lot of them said, yeah, these are people that I would hang out with. Um, but there has been some criticism um, and some of the criticism is focused on kind of the high level communication skills of the cast. Some viewers want to see a nonverbal cast member added, which would be fantastic. I hope they consider that. And then another critique kind of echoes the criticism that Life Goes On got, which that it featured basically people with Down syndrome who are quite independent and talented, whereas in real life there might be people with Down syndrome who may need a caregiver or other support throughout their lives. I think that's a great point from the critics. But I think it's starting this conversation, and um, hopefully they will start talking about the wider spectrum of people who have Down syndrome and the different skills that they might have that might not include verbal skills, but they might be doing something else. So the mother of Sean, who's on the show, said, quote, parents of children both with and without Down syndrome are watching the show together and having important discussions about acceptance, abortion, and making friends with people who are different from themselves. So it has a picture of Elena and Megan hugging. Um, and I think it, it also just is about friendship. So it's sometimes when I'm watching it, it's just like, what are they talking about is all about friendship. And it could be any other reality show talking about friendship or resolving conflicts, that kind of thing. So, but I think it just has a much more kind of honest feel because people are just presenting themselves as they want to present themselves and not trying to kind of fake it. And then finally, I want to talk a little about speechless. So I feel like this is a way that authenticity has kind of come back to network television. So it's a show on um, ABC that in this picture, Minnie Driver plays the mother, um, forgetting the names of the other two actors. Anyway, this picture is um, the JJ character play, played by Micah Fowler coming off of his van and the wheelchair lift and um, so it's a family comedy with um, two parents, three kids, the oldest son has cerebral palsy and is nonverbal and it's played by um, Micah Fowler who also has cerebral palsy but is also verbal. And a quote from our friend Lawrence Carter Long at the National Council on Disability, speechless matters because inclusivity on TV promotes inclusivity in life too. And I, before I forget, um, in this PowerPoint, I've put all the links to things that I've talked about in the notes section. So when you get the PowerPoint, just go into the notes section and you can find Lawrence's article that he wrote about Speechless. So here are some of the aspects of Speechless that I think makes it um, more authentic. So obviously that actor Micah Fowler, who plays um, JJ, also has CP. A person with CP who uses a letter board, a laser pointer, and an aid, just like the JJ character, is actually a consultant on the show. And I'm working on a new research project about Speechless, and I feel like the topics that are on Speechless are um, topics that are important in the disability community, especially the disability rights community and um, the disability parenting community. So they're really taking on disability issues, but each show is not just about a disability issue. It's you know about another character, the father or the sister or the other brother. And so you know those kind of topics it has taken on just in the few months it's been on inspiration porn, disciplining disabled children, overzealous parents, negotiating friendships and relationships when one is nonverbal high price tag of disability related equipment and on and on. The family is not rich by any stretch of the imagination. So they basically moved the, the pilot, they moved into the neighborhood that they did, into the cruddiest house in the neighborhood so that they could get into a school district that had the best services for the JJ character who's a wheelchair user. So it really is taking on actual issues, authentic issues in the disability community. And I feel like the whole cast is committed to making sure the show is as authentic as possible. So last year, um, this um, she calls herself the AAC journalist. Her name is Marlena May Coutine, and she is an Australian um, writer and journalist and interviewer. From um, she has a degree in journalism from the University in Brisbane. And so she uses assistive technology, 
And before she came to the States for kind of a tour and doing interviews, she contacted Mini Driver to interview her, and Mini Driver agreed. So she has a two-part interview with Mini Driver on YouTube that you can go find. But in the middle of the interview, Driver wants to learn about the technology that Marlena is using. And so it becomes kind of an educational moment for her as an actor, too, even though she's not portraying somebody with the uses assistive communication devices. She's playing the mother of someone who uses them. So, you know, she's trying to bring authenticity to her role by learning about the technology that um, her television son would be using. And so I feel like that is also something that's happening in the, at least the television world, that a lot of the acting world, even non-disabled actors, are trying to make sure that if they're involved with a project that includes disability, that they're, you know, trying to be as authentic as possible and, you know, make sure that the um, narratives and the acting that they're doing is serving a purpose of more authentic disability on television. And so just a couple more slides and then we'll get to questions. So I found this from a um, Variety article just not that long ago, um, last November. And um, I just felt like it really, if they will stick with what they said in these quotes, we'll be kind of good to go for authenticity. So this is from Jennifer Salky, the president of NBC Entertainment, who said, quote, to create a successful show in network television, the largest possible audience needs to be able to relate to the characters and stories. And that audience is made up of people from all different backgrounds and experiences. So yes, she is saying what all of us have been saying for a long time, that if you're going to present a community, you need people from that community to be part of that narrative. And that means actors, it means behind the scenes people, working on camera, you know, production team people, directors. So it isn't just actors we see, but it really needs to be Hollywood needs to step up and hire people with disabilities for all aspects of their productions. And then the fa final quote um, is from Marcy Liroff, who is a was a casting director on big projects like E.T. and Insomnia. And she says, her profession has to give more opportunities to disabled and transgender performers. Quote, it can't just be about what's written on the page. If we're doing our job, we have to think that if a part is written for a man, maybe we should try it with a woman. Or maybe that funny kid can be played by an actor in a wheelchair, end quote. So what questions do you all have? Let me know. Questions, thoughts? Hi, Does ben. that be a question? Give me a comment. We have some questions. Um, Kylie had asked, I am uh, disabled and I'm working towards uh, getting greater diversity in media through working with the publishing industry. What do you feel is the greatest obstacle to presenting minorities in media and uh, diversifying stories? Yeah, I think the biggest obstacle is actually the whole production side of things. If you're going high-end network television, you know, Hollywood film, because that has a huge kind of bureaucracy and structure and, you know, budgetary issues. So what I tell people is, you know, start while you're in, you know, young or just trying to get going, you know, have a blog, write your own stories, you know, have a YouTube channel and, you know, interview people or do your own. Um, I want to give a shout out to Teal Scherer who has a great web series called My Gimpy Life. And so, you know, she was, she's a wheelchair user who's an actor who wasn't getting as many jobs booked as she would have liked. So she just started her own web series and she had two seasons of it. And, um, you know, she got funding and it's fantastic, you know, web series. So I think there's a lot of opportunities now for using online, um, resources to kind of put your own narratives out there, your own stories, um, whatever you want to do, you can put it out there. And sometimes Hollywood will come calling when they see your stuff on YouTube. One of the um, people on um, Born This Way, John, who's an aspiring hip hop artist or rapper, um, somebody saw, you know, one of his videos he put online and then flew him to Atlanta for, you know, to do some, um, 
production of some of his songs. So if you put yourself out there, hopefully um, traditional Hollywood will come calling, but even if they don't, I think you can make your name on other platforms like YouTube. Um, Lizzie Weiss, who's the creator and showrunner of um, Switched at Birth, said that having a character with a disability or deafness um, was actually not her idea. When she was pitching the idea of two teenagers being switched at birth to the network, they actually said to her, hey, um, can we make one of the um, girls who were switching disabled? So, I mean, the fact that somebody from a network actually thought about that means we're moving in the right direction. And because she'd taken the ASL um, drama class in college, she jumped right in with, um, you know, how about if one of the girls is deaf? So, you know, even Hollywood is kind of coming around, too. Okay, wait, now I can see the oh, um, questions. It. Great, great. Yeah. And so it's a, there's a lot of questions that poured in, so you can actually open up that window. Um, Got it. Yeah, you can. <laughs> so there's a few of them there. Um, you okay. See. Sorry for the delay. Let me read a couple of no them. Problem. So lots of questions about the um, where the PowerPoint and audio is going to be. Yeah. So I had answered those. I, I think we're going to be sending out a uh, video following this webinar. Uh, not today, but in a few days, we're going to have a follow-up email that will contain the PDF of the presentation that you sent, and then also a video that's captioned. Great. Yeah. Okay, so Dina wrote in saying that Survivor also had people with disabilities, so great. I'll add that to my list. She said there was one season that had a woman who was deaf, so thank you for that information. Um, Dancing with the Stars, obviously several um, who were deaf or were amputees. Waiting for them to have wheelchair dance on Dancing with the Stars. I think that would be really cool, so I'm hoping they'll they'll go that way at some point. Um, Ali Stoker on Glee Project, yep, that also is on my list. Um, um, one person had asked, uh, Kathy had asked, is there any one source for people with disabilities who want to be employed in the media? That seems like a pretty good question. Yes, um, so um, shout out to Terry. Um, Squire, Terry Hartman Squires, because she has been running programs to um, do networking so young people with disabilities can be in touch with people from the entertainment industry. So if you go on and just Google her name, Terry Hartman Squires, you'll find um, some of the things she's doing. She's based in LA and um, so hope it's okay, Terry, to give a shout out to you. And um, so that's a great, she's a great resource, and there's a lot more. It's called Lights Camera Access 2.0, so they've been doing several events um, each year to try to have networking and get people, young people with disabilities, um, seen by people in the entertainment industry. So that's a great um, idea. Uh, Meg has a question, does authenticity reinforce the discourse, discourse that disability is negatively positioned against the idea of ability slash normalcy? Fantastic question. <laughs> um, I would hope that that's not the case. I think television in particular gives a much more nuanced kind of authenticity because, yes, they are positioned against other characters in the TV show. But typically, like in a family drama, they're positioned against them as siblings or as, you know, they're positioned against them for gender or age or all these other kind of intersectional components of who they are. So, yes, it could be negatively positioned, but I think more often the authenticity is there because that's a positive kind of positioning of disability that if there's an acceptance and empowerment and an authentic, authentic representation as opposed to a more negative one. Um, and I mean, I didn't mention, you know, ones that I think are not great, even though I can't think of that many. <laughs> but, you know, obviously some of the ones that are not very authentic or that come off as a bit offensive get canceled. I mean, the community now has a nice platform with social media to complain when, um, you know, 
not good shows are created or inauthentic shows. And I think because of trend and not just disability, but in lots of different diversity categories is to be more authentic in television that a lot of, um, you know, because Hollywood is very much follow the leaders. So, you know, once a show like Swish at Birth got ratings, you know, they got a lot of good ratings their first couple of years, then other you know, showrunners, production teams are like, oh, well, this is, you know, great to have a topic like have a character with deafness. And, you know, even though it might add different things to the production, it's still, if it's bringing in ratings, that's all that Hollywood cares about. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think authenticity is kind of a trend in all of television right now. So it's a great time to see kind of more empowering representation. and. Francis has a question about Warwick Davis's Life's Too Short. Um, yes, I have seen it. I can't remember as much about it. It was kind of a, one of those in-your-face, much more British humor kinds of things, so I don't want to criticize it, um, but I think it did have a few um, kind of issues, but that could be because I'm American and I'm not reading it as a British audience might. Um, but it's still you know, and I also think he was a very brave in that show because he kind of played a jerk. And um, so that is his choice. And um, and also it gives a dimension, you know, if he wants to play a jerk, then um, that's his decision to make. It's his show. And I don't mind that he's playing a jerk, but sometimes people too often associate disability with negative qualities, so um, I think that's why you kind of have to be a little bit careful, but I still think it's it's a good show to have out there in the mix of disability representation. Uh, Lauren wants me to talk about the impact of non-disabled actors playing disabled characters, so this is, in my opinion, offensive. It's called um, Crip Drag, and so it is not something that should be going on. Here's the only time when I think it could be going on, which is if there's a sequence where you have to have the person both before and after injury, and there's just no way to have somebody um, play a disabled person without having somebody play non-disabled. But here's my answer to that, even that dilemma, is that they use CGI to make people disabled. Um, in like Forrest Gump, you know, that kind of thing. Gary Sinise was made an amputee with CGI. Why can't they go the opposite direction? So they could make a non-disabled, I mean a disabled actor, you know, they could CGI on um, the ability to walk in some kind of, you know, scene in the past. And so I'd rather have them go that direction with CGI rather than disabling non-disabled act actors with um, computer graphics. But I think the larger impact is that it is not a um, authentic representation. It's somebody who has not lived that experience. I know I've talked to actors about this and non-disabled actors have told me, but, but that's the challenge to play somebody not like you. Yes, correct, but they're talking usually about personality when they're talking about playing somebody not like you. So, you know, a white person should not be playing a black person, a white person should not be playing an Asian person. So I think that is where we have to bring that discussion. That it is not okay to play somebody of a different race if that's not your race. And it's the same with the disability experience. It's an identity. Actually, one of my students talked about this yesterday. They had read a blog by an autistic woman, and she said she loved the phrase autistic woman because she is a black woman, felt that that was exactly what the phrase should be. She's a black woman. She's not going to get rid of her identity as a black person, just as an autistic person typically doesn't want to get rid of their identity as an autistic person. I don't know if that answers your question. It just gets me all riled up <laughs> um, about these non-disabled people playing disabled. Um, Moya, do you remember the actress on Facts of Life that had CP? I'm unsure of her name. Her name was Jerry Jewell, um, and she's out there on social media, so you can find her there. Um, Kyla, as a woman of color with a disability, we never see intersectionality. Why do you think that is? 
Great question. Um, on Switched at Birth, they did have um, some deaf actors of color. Um, so I think they're finally becoming more aware of intersectionality. Um, but I think they're too busy patting themselves on the back by um, having a person with a disability. They didn't think, oh, well, maybe we should have a person of a different race that's non-white or um, you know, somebody who is female. Um, so I think there's still miles to go. And, um, but I guess, again, why I like um, Born This Way is because it is more intersectional than a lot of shows um, because it has racial diversity, doesn't really have age diversity or even disability diversity, but it's still, you know, about a group of people from different backgrounds that all happen to have Down syndrome. So I'm hopeful that, um, you know, with people like Alice Wong with the Disability Visibility Project, you know, she's really highlighting a lot of what's going on in a more intersectional space regarding disability. So I highly recommend that you guys follow her um, blog and website. It's called the Disability Visibility Project. Uh, Janine, what do you think of the furor about Glee's use of a non-disabled actor playing wheelchair user? I think that was wrong. And you're right, it's laziness on the part of casting directors. And I think Ryan Murphy has always used people with disabilities. Back when he did Nip Tuck, Peter Dinklage was on the show and they had several different storylines that were disability related. And so I think he had also he did American Horror Story, the freak show edition, which had plenty of actors with disabilities. So I think he's started in a place where he new to include people with disabilities, but then he really screwed up when he hired a person without a disability to play a wheelchair user on the show. And he might argue that, well, we had to do these dream sequences or something where the character could dance or whatever. Um, but I think they could have taken care of that. But because of the furor about it, um, you know, people like Lauren Potter were hired, Ali Stoker, more people with disabilities got onto the show. So um, it's kind of like that lemons to lemonade kind of thing. You know, they screw up in Hollywood and now we have a platform to tell them when they've screwed up. And sometimes they will fix things and hire more people with disabilities and, you know, make the show more authentic. Um, regarding your new research on Speechless, what specifically are you narrowing your research on? So this is from Corinne. And what I'm looking at is kind of these themes that I'm identifying as a more authentic representation of kind of disability content on television. So I'm going to be going through all the episodes and looking at any kind of disability theme that is um, being presented there. Jody asks, are there any new shows on the horizon featuring, featuring disabled individuals? Hmm, great question. I don't know if there are. Um, sometimes there's characters on shows that exist that, you know, they bring on a disabled um, actor and character, and then s there's shows in production that I don't know what's going to be happening. But the Ruderman TV Challenge is happening right now, and so the stats I got um, from Terry Hartman Squires is that the... Um, there's over 50 disabled performers that have been auditioning for pilots. This is pilot season. And um, so fingers crossed that we're going to get a lot more um, disabled actors and disabled production teams in the future. Um, I'm trying to think. There was a show that um, I can't remember <laughs> right now. But, you know, start Googling and um, hopefully, if you start Googling every week in the future, you'll see, you know, some stories popping up about. Because the other great thing about when disabled actors are hired is that the entertainment media starts covering it. So it gets a little bit extra kind of media coverage when a show does include people with disabilities as the performers. I mentioned abortion twice. Um, on Life Goes On and Born This Way, is that only a coincidence? Could you speak to any of that? That's from Denise. So the reason I put that those quotes in there is because um, whenever 
there's a character or reality show featuring people with Down syndrome, the conversation always kind of includes the topic of abortion because, you know, there's really good prenatal testing in North America, so women can find out if they're having a child with Down syndrome. But I think in, at least in the U.S. and Canada, a lot of women are keeping their children um, with Down syndrome because we see in the media and in real life a lot more opportunities for people with Down syndrome to live a happy, successful, inclusive life in this North American setting. Um, so I think it gets people thinking. Um, you know, television doesn't like to use the word abortion at all, and it's very rare in the last few years is the first times that they've actually used the word, because it was a very no-no topic. Um, but I think that without saying it, having people with Down syndrome telling their own stories like in Born This Way is a way that people are kind of seeing that there's a future for their child with Down syndrome, that these are adults and they can have a life. And so that's why I hope they get kind of more diverse space of people with Down syndrome on Born This Way so they can see that, yes, not everything is, might be rosy um, in the future, but, you know, with support, people with Down syndrome can live a fantastic life. Um, Hi, Beth. This you a, know, Mountain Farm. Sorry. So, no, no, I was going to say there's a, there's so many questions that came in. Um, we're sort of coming close to an end, but I just wanted – there was one that seemed really good. Um, okay. If we could skip up a little bit. Um, okay. Can you recommend what to do when people cite something you see as inspiration porn? Um, oh, great. Why do you think it is still considered okay to – sorry. Yeah, yeah that's – what should you the do? Inspiration the inspiration question. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah that's great. I will address that in one second. But I want to give a shout out to Heather's question about um, becoming bulletproof. We actually had a screening of it, and several people were here. And that is a fantastic film that I actually recommend because it's all people with disabilities making a movie. So um, I think you know there's more um, productions. And when people with disabilities are involved, I think you're going to get a lot less inspiration porn because they don't want that, you know, the actors don't want that to be the theme of whatever production they're in. So, you know, they're going to kind of keep the production team honest, hopefully, and not going into the direction of inspiration porn. And I'll, hopefully a lot of people on this webcast or this webinar have seen the Stella Young um, TED Talk, so just Google Stella Young. Um, TED Talk, and she talks a lot about the problems that inspiration porn cause for the disabled community all over the world, and um, I completely agree with her commentary in that TED Talk um, because it really distorts people's lives, and I think the worst part besides the distortion is that it's non-disabled people actually kind of using disabled people to feel better about themselves, and that's not okay. Whenever you're using somebody else, that is not okay behavior. And I think a lot of people don't understand that the memes and things that they see that are inspiration porn are offensive, and they're using them in a, such a way that they're trying to make themselves feel good at the expense of a person with a disability who did not agree to be their inspiration. So. Um, that's a major problem with inspiration porn. It's, it's kind of a way that people are being used without their knowledge. If somebody's a motivational speaker who has a disability and they want to talk about how inspiring they are, then that's their right to do that. But you know, the non-disabled community um, using those memes and those videos and those pictures to feel good about themselves is not okay. Okay, one last question. I think we're running out of time. Um, and um, Beth, also we can we can go a little bit over because I I just I see that there's some people who would probably want their <laughs> answers, their questions answered. But um, I think there's a few that I can kind of skip forward to if you like. Okay. Yeah. Um. And honestly, people, if you want to email me your questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, there was a question about um training um opportunities for yeah 
I think um, it's an interesting question because, you know, still a lot of theater um, departments at universities and colleges have an audition process, so you still have to audition. In the old days, the audition process was inaccessible to a lot of people, so it was very difficult for people to get training at the college and university level. I think the inaccessibility problem has probably been solved with a lot of buildings at a lot of colleges and universities, but I think the attitudinal discrimination and ableism is probably still there. So, you know, what you might have to do is go to, you know, specialty theaters that, you know, do training as opposed to colleges and universities. Not that all colleges and universities are ableist, but I just feel like that there's some kind of that audition process is a very subjective area and people can be rejected for the wrong reasons. Um, and also you can go into film programs and things like that, television production programs that have no audition process. So, you know, I would just recommend regular old journalism, television production um, programs, film production programs at the college or university levels. Even at the community college levels, usually they have some production classes. Um, so you can get skills of how to run a camera or how to take pictures or how to write a screenplay, that kind of thing. So I would say go to those ones that are out there in lots and lots of different educational venues and um, get training there. The, um, there's something called With TV that wanted to provide training for people with disabilities. I don't know that it ever got the training component, but they were wanting to create their own television network that would be a training platform. So hopefully that will happen in the future. Um, and then the, like the project that um, Terry Hartman Squire is doing, um, Lights, Camera Access 2.0, I would Google that too because that will help put you in touch with people that can talk about training opportunities and getting yourself into a media job because that is really important. I'm glad you asked that question because getting into those kind of jobs, you do have to have training and so, you know, by hook or crook, try to get there and get into some kind of program so you'll have the credentials and they can't reject you. Um, at least you'll have the skills to, you know, start doing And like I said, start doing projects on your own. Make those YouTube videos, write those blog posts, you know, write those articles, write your own screenplays, write your own television treatments, you know, do it all and then, because it's, it's a kind of a great world where you have access to all these media tools. You can make a movie with your phone, you know, go do it. And then you'll have something to show people um, and they might latch on to it because like we're talking about authenticity is really important now. Oh yeah, Terry reminds me of Melissa Thompson who has Ramp Up Your Voice. Is a great blog on intersectionality. She's African-American woman with a disability. So highly recommend Ramp Up Your Voice. Melissa Thompson. Okay, we have one minute, so I'm going to use it to thank you all for um, attending this webinar, and please email me. The um, I think I had it on the first slide, but it's B-H-A-L-L-E-R at Towson, T-O-W-S-O-N dot E-D-U, and even if 500 people crash the email server here at Towson, that's no problem. I'll try to get to your questions if you email me, and um, please be in touch because a lot of the stuff that I find out about is from somebody telling me that, oh, there's this new show because now with a thousand channels, I can't watch everything. <laughs> I would like to try, but I can't watch everything on television or in film. So, um, or if you see things in the news too, let me know about it. I really appreciate you guys um, attending, and I hope that um, you know we can have this conversation at another time as well. Take care.